problem with my voice tonight. <clears throat> I hope I can be heard. We're over in the book of Revelation. We're looking at verses 9 through 20, the Son of Man vision, and we have tonight part 7. We're in Revelation chapter 1, looking at verses 9 through 20. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Gracious Father, we pray once again for your wisdom, we pray for understanding of this, your word. We pray that you might open our hearts and minds to be receptive, and not merely to understand intellectually, but to be obedient to what we understand. We thank you, Father, for the book of Revelation. It tells us the future. It tells us things that are surely to happen, for Jesus himself has certified it and sent it to us. He is the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. And because he is the truth, he tells us the truth, though using symbolic language, he tells us the truth of what things will be, in fact. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last week we were comparing the book of Joel with the book of Acts, which gets us into the church age in which we live. And we saw that the book of Joel talks a great deal about the day of the Lord, in addition to giving the two keys that bring us into this period of time that we know as the church. It's a very important passage, verses 28 through 32 in Joel chapter 2, are all that Peter quotes in Acts chapter 2, saying, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And Joel contains not only prophecy concerning the coming of the Holy Spirit, which is the first thing that Peter picks up out of Joel chapter 2 to preach about, but Peter also picks up the second thing, which is where he ends. He starts with the coming of the Holy Spirit, as we see on the day of Pentecost, and he ends with, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He quotes the entire passage, verses 28 through 32, but he only picks up those two things that he's going to talk about in Acts chapter 2. That's very important because that is what, in fact, 
opens for us the church age. We see on the day of Pentecost that there were 3,000 Jewish men that got saved. But we also saw, as we looked through the book of Joel, that a major portion of the book of Joel deals with the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a very huge subject. I hope you've picked that up over the last six weeks as we have gone through many, many passages in the Old Testament that talk about the day of the Lord. They describe the judgment that's coming. They give specific events that are going to happen, specific nations that are going to be involved in the day of the Lord. They tell specific things that God himself is going to do. They tell us the length of the day of the Lord. They tell us how the, the Messiah is going to come and judge, how he's going to set his feet down on the Mount of Olives and split it in half and enter triumphantly into the city of Jerusalem. Things that have not yet happened. Those are things that are yet future. But one of the major themes of Joel is the day of the Lord. But in the middle of that book, are the two keys that open the door for us into this age in which we find ourselves now. An age which was a mystery in the Old Testament. We saw the doors there, but we didn't know what was behind them. <laughs> On the day of Pentecost, we see what's behind those two doors, and that is the opening of the gospel, and we saw that as we went through the book of Acts, that there is a 12-fold or 12-step expansion out from Jerusalem. It begins with Jewish males in chapter 2, in the courtyard of the men. We talked about that when we were studying Acts. In Acts chapter 5, we find Jewish males and Jewish females, Ananias and Sapphira. Then we find widowed females in chapter 6. Then we find Samaritans who are half Jew and half Gentile, plus men and women in Acts chapter 8. Then we saw it expanded to a Gentile by birth, but a Jew by religion, also in Acts 8, who is neither male nor female, the Ethiopian eunuch. Then we saw the door open to the Jewish persecutor and killer in chapter 9, that's Saul. Then we saw, much to the shock of many, certainly at that time, that the gospel expanded to those who were 100% Gentile, Romans in Acts chapter 10, with Cornelius and his household being brought in to the family of faith. Then it expanded to biracial children of mixed marriages in Acts 16, Timothy with a Gentile father and a Jewish mother. Then it expanded to female heads of homes in Acts 16 also with Lydia. Then it expanded to entire families, including Gentiles in Acts 16, the Philippian jailer. And then surprisingly, the last group was Old Testament saints, those who were disciples of John, who did not know that the Messiah had come. They were looking forward to him still. That he'd come, he'd been crucified, had risen, and the Pentecost had occurred and the Holy Spirit had been given. They'd been baptized only with the baptism of John. That's Acts chapter 19. And in the middle of all this, we see the territorial expansion into the Gentile world outside the land of Israel from Acts 11 throughout the rest of the book of Acts. We also saw that Joel is speaking in the context of national Israel, real Jews, actually being present in the land. And you know that from 70 AD and following, the Jews were driven out of the land. The city of Jerusalem fell in 70 AD to Titus, the Roman general, who destroyed the city and they turned that city into a pagan city and the Jews were dispersed all over the world. That's the second diaspora, the second dispersion of the Jews, the first happening back in the days of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. But now we find the second diaspora and they are in the world, all over the world right now. But they are coming back to the land miraculously. May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation state in a day as prophesied by the Old Testament prophets. And so now we are setting the stage for all the things that are about to happen. I think we are on the cusp, the cusp of the day of the Lord beginning. We'll be out of here at the rapture, but we're on the cusp of the cup before the wrath of God is poured out on the earth. So those two key elements, we talk the two key triggers that open the 12-part expansion that I've just given. We saw Peter quoting uh, Joel 2, 28 through 32. I pointed out there are many things in the text that are also literally true that have not yet happened, like the remnant principle at the end of verse 32. Uh, he talks about election and the sovereign calling of God in that same passage. Peter doesn't discuss those, although those are true. But also he talks about future events, future events that are yet to happen and will, in fact, happen. I read you a bunch of other passages that give huge amounts of details about the day of the Lord out of Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, and Malachi. So our conclusion 
at the end of all that humongous discussion that took us six weeks, was the day of the Lord, that is the day of Jehovah, is clearly anticipated and described in the Old Testament in massive de detail. It's a major theme of prophecy. Some of the passages about the day of the Lord deal with the tribulation. Some of them deal with the second coming. Some of them deal with the millennial reign of Christ, but they all speak of the period as the day of the Lord and are all yet future events. The day of the Lord is characterized by judgment on the world, by the wrath of God, by war, destruction, natural disaster, signs and wonders, the rape of Israel, ascendancy of the Antichrist and his destruction, the battle of Armageddon, judgment of the nations. And as I mentioned a moment ago, there are many specific nations that play specific parts during this period of time. The second coming of Christ in power, the millennium, the binding of Satan before his release, and the second and final battle of Gog and Magog at the end of the millennium. Huge amount of material in the Old Testament on the day of the Lord, and that is precisely what is covered in the book of Revelation. We concluded that Peter also speaks of the day of the Lord in the context of one day being a thousand years and a thousand years being as a day. It's a long but a limited and distinct period of time in prophecy. It is not an open-ended date-guessing mechanism. I also concluded in our discussion on the day of the Lord by pointing out that it has nothing to do with God using long ages in the creation of the world, which is how theistic evolutionists try to excuse the passage. Because Peter is dealing with the end of history, not the beginning of history. Peter's talking about consummation, not creation. And then we moved into a brand new study last week, which was the last days in the New Testament. That covers a period of time before the day of the Lord. That contrast of the last days relates to the rotting character of the church and the decadence of the world prior to the rapture. We looked at a number of references. First, we went back to our transitional reference on the day of Pentecost, which transitions from Israel's time clock to the mystery period of the church age and saw that the phrase the last days is the next transitioning key that Joel 2 contains. Peter's quoting Joel when he says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. That passage, as the previous verses we talked about, was also written primarily to Jews just before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. We see that Hebrews talks about the same thing in Hebrews chapter 1. That's immediately before the destruction. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, who hath the appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds. We then saw the phrase, the last days, is used in many other places in the New Testament, and always refers to rot and corruption that occurs as the church fails in the commission that Christ gave to us, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. And the church has failed to do that. After 2,000 years, we have failed to do that. There are still about 5,000 languages into which the scriptures have not yet been translated. We are to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so we have failed to do what God called us to do. And during this period of time, the church will fade into irrelevancy and into apostasy. We talked about apostasy this morning. When you see the phrase, the last days after the Pentecost transition, the description is clearly not the same as the description of the day of the Lord. When you see the last days, what you find is a lot of rot and corruption and apostasy and turning from the faith and things like that. When you see the day of the Lord, you see judgment and fire and all kinds of horrible events taking place around the world that God is sending on the earth. And we talk about those in the book of Revelation. We're going to see the seven seal judgments and the seven trumpet judgments and the as, as we look at the book of Revelation, the seven vials that are poured out, I believe, during the last week of the tribulation. Intense, incredible judgments of God that he pours out upon the earth. But that's not the same as the descriptions of the last days. The phrase, the last days, is not the same. We have a description instead of filthy rot and of corruption. 2 Timothy 3, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And what's the description? Is it fire and judgment and hail and brimstone and all that? No. Last days, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. The self-esteem movement is very popular in America. I think you've probably picked up on that. You've got to really think well of yourself. That's a characteristic of the last days. People focus on themselves. 
That's crept into the church, too, a lot of so-called Christian psychology. Uh, <clears throat> we've got to make everybody really think that they are cool, really think that they are good. Never talk about sin, never talk about judgment, uh, never talk about the chastening hand of the Lord, never talk about God dealing with the church and spanking them as they ought to be spanked. Tell them positive things. You've got a lot of TV preachers that are like that. You never, they never say anything bad. They, some of them, like Joel Osteen says, hell, well, I, I don't know, I don't know. You find that phrase, I don't know, often, whenever something like that comes up, I don't know, I don't know. You don't know when you're a preacher. You ought to know, it's what the Bible teaches. If you don't know the Bible, then why are you a preacher? If you know the Bible, the Bible talks about sin. The Bible talks about chastening. The Bible talks about judgment. And the church needs to hear it. We've been studying that kind of thing in the morning worship service where God is judging Israel because they refused to obey what he told them to do. And it was simple. But they still did not believe, and because they did not believe, they did not obey. How many churches are like that? There are many of them today that don't care what God's word says. They only care what modern psychology says, what's politically correct, how can we feel good, uh, you know, how's the rest of the world treating something we want to fit in uh, so we don't, uh, you know, we don't want to stick out, we want to blend with all the crowd all around us regardless of which way they're going. The last days, that's what we're talking about. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous. Boy, that fits America. Boasters, proud. Blasphemers, disobedient to parents unthankful, unholy. This is describing character quality. The last days deals with the rot of the character quality of the church and of all of society. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of, they look so good, having a form of godliness. On the outside it's a veneer, because inside it's full of worms and full of trash and full of rot and full of corruption. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins led away with diverse lusts. Boy, you see that kind of stuff going on all over the place. All kinds of apostates involved in immorality and then they're exposed. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They got all kinds of PhDs and they pompously sit up there and talk about how they don't believe the Bible because they got a PhD from Harvard or something. Look, the word of God stands forever. Their PhD is going to rot when they die. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further. Their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. We understand the last days, what it's going to be like. It's not going to be God's judgment on the world. It's going to be the world persecuting genuine believers. There's a difference when God sends judgments on the world, he's judging the wicked. When the church lives a godly life and preaches the truth, they get persecuted by the pagans. That's what happens during the last days. The day of the Lord is when God sends his judgments on the wicked world because the church is out of there. You say, well, can you show me where it says that the last days refers to the unbelievers persecuting the church? Yes, in the same passage here. You fully know my doctrine. This is the very next verse. Manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch. Now, was God sending it or were the pagans doing it? It was the pagans. Read the book of Acts. Iconium, Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. What's he been talking about? All the rot and corruption that is in both the church and in the world. He says, you want to stand against that? You want to live for Christ? You want to live a holy life? You want to preach the truth and tell others the truth of the gospel? Do you know what you can expect? You can expect persecution. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Let me just ask you a hypothetical question. You can answer it to yourself. When was the last time 
you were persecuted. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you're living godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. If you've suffered no persecution, there's something missing in your life. The last days, characterized by all the rotten corruption, also characterized by the persecution of Christians. So it's obvious that we're living in the last days, but we're definitely not living in the day of the Lord. James describes the last day in the same way as they were described by Paul, corruption on earth rather than judgment by God. And he talks about it. You rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. And rust of them is a witness against you. And eat your flesh it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. And then he talks how they rip off their employees and stuff and live in pleasure on the earth. They're wanton. They have their hearts nourished as in the day of slaughter. They condemn and kill the just. And he doesn't resist them. He's describing rot and corruption. He's not describing the judgment of God, and he calls that the last days. James also makes it clear that the judgment of God is a future event, because that's what he moves into after he talks about the last day. The next thing after the last days is the judgment of God. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband will wait for the precious fruit of the earth, and it has long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be patient, establish your heart. The coming of the Lord draws nigh. It was still future when James wrote that. Behold, the judge stands before the door. In other words, judgment is imminent, but it has not yet arrived. They're in the last days. James talks about what's going on then, and he calls it the last days, and then he says, judgment is coming. It hasn't gotten here yet. You've got to make these distinctions. The last days is characterized by persecution of believers, but the suffering is from the pagan world. It is not suffering under the judging hand of God. We always must distinguish between the two. Peter says the same thing about the last days. It's a time of unbelief. It's a time when pagans mock. And he says that the last days will precede the day of the Lord. It's a separate period of time. We're living in it right now, but it precedes the day of the Lord. It comes before God sends his judgment on the day of the Lord, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? They say, oh, you Christians, you're so stupid. For 2,000 years, you said Jesus is going to come back. And they mock and they scoff. And they say, okay, so come on, tell me, where is the promise of his coming? That's what characterizes the last days. We're surrounded by people like that, folks. They say, how can you believe the Bible? Jesus said he's coming again, and we've had 2,000 years since he was here. So where is the promise of his coming? That's a character quality of the last days. And judgment follows that. Peter goes on to that. This they are willingly ignorant of by the word of God. The heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water. In other words, they deny creation. They deny the flood. Whereas the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. And then he says, and so... God's going to send another kind of judgment. The heavens and the earth, which are now, it hadn't come yet. The judgment hadn't fallen yet. By the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Last days precedes the day of the Lord. The apostasy, the falling away in the church, the rot and corruption of the world precedes the judgment of God that comes upon the world. The persecution of believers intensifies and intensifies during the last days. And then they're taken out. And then God sends the tribulation. I mean, it's a very simple formula. Always distinguish between the last days and the day of the Lord. Now, let's turn our attention to the next major section of the Son of Man vision. I turn to see the voice, and this is all brand new material now. I turn to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Now the very first thing, John turns to see a voice. You know, we say, how can you see a voice? 
Well, what John sees is not a voice. He sees a person, and he suddenly recognizes who it is, and he falls down flat on his face. Because it's the Lord Jesus in his glory. It's the Son of Man. And Jesus used the term the Son of Man for himself more often than he used any other term to refer to himself. He called himself the Son of Man. And that's what we find portrayed for us here in Revelation chapter 1. This is clearly the Lord Jesus Christ who is speaking here. That's the voice that he hears. I saw one like unto the Son of Man in the appearance of, that's what that word like unto is a reference to. We'll see that used in several key places both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's an idiom that means his appearance was. John sees Jesus here in his glory. But what he actually sees first, he saw seven golden candlesticks. I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. First thing that he notices, the seven candlesticks. Now, when we see pictures of, like if you've seen the uh, wood carvings or the woodcuts by Albrecht Durer, uh, where he made woodcuts of the various things that occur in the book of Revelation, uh, I have a complete set of those. Uh, my father republished them many years ago. Uh, they're beautiful uh, engravings. But what it shows is Jesus standing in a, 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 the midst of some seven lamps, I mean candlesticks like this. They got candles on top of them. The word that's used there is the word for a lampstand. It's not a candle like we look at here, but it's a lampstand. When we think of candlesticks, we're thinking of something like these candles around the auditorium. But it's a picture of a seven-branch lampstand that was in the tabernacle and in the temple. Because as we go through the book of Revelation, we'll find that there are many references to various items within the tabernacle and the temple which appear in the book of Revelation, and it helps us to understand what pictures God gave us in the Old Testament to refer to the prophetic future. Very, very significant. What we have here would have been a seven-branched menorah with oil lamps with gravity-fed oil supply tubes. You say, how can you prove that? Well, because Zechariah talks about it too. It's prophetically stated for us in Zechariah chapter 4. Let me read to you the first three verses. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, <clears throat> one on the right side of the bowl and the other on the left side, because the oil lamps are fed by olive oil. You've got a bowl up on the top. You've got pipes that run down from the bowl where the olive oil is contained, the two olive trees which are providing the oil for the bowl, and you have it running down into the various lamps in the seven-branched, what we call a menorah. We see that in Revelation, you're going to discover a lot of the pictures that are given to you in Revelation are also explained in other parts, parts of Scripture. Now, let's talk about oil for a minute. Oil in the Scripture is a picture or a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Oil is a picture or a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, stop and think about what the oil lamp is doing. It's giving light. It's giving light. But it's secondary to the person of Christ who is the one portrayed as the Son of Man in this vision. So you say, well, how can you have two lights? And one of them has got seven, and here's Christ himself glowing in glory. So what in the world is going on with the seven-branched oil lamp? Well, our text tells us specifically what it is. It specifically says that the seven lamps are the seven churches. Now, that's what's, listed, that's what's discussed in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. There are seven different churches. Those are seven historic churches that were in Asia Minor. They're in sort of a fan-shaped arc. Uh, if you put Patmos, where John is located at this time, the Isle of Patmos, and you run a, a sort of an arc around that across Asia Minor, Turkey we call it today, you'll find all seven churches listed in order around that arc. So these are letters to specific churches 
But as you read what Christ says about the churches, you discover that there are seven different kinds of churches. Each one has different character qualities. You discover, as you look at church history, throughout church history, there have been these seven different types of churches throughout church history also that bear those character qualities of each of the churches, which we'll study in detail when we get to chapter 2 and following. It's interesting that the last one that is mentioned is Laodicea. Laodicea was the compromising church. Laodicea is the one that they're not zealous for Christ, they're not cold against Christ, they're lukewarm, tepid. And Jesus says, I will spew out of my mouth because you're neither hot nor cold. You're just tepid. That describes the church in its apostasy. That describes the church in the last days. That describes the church today in America. That's a serious warning, folks. Jesus still loves all of the churches, but he has some severe rebukes for those who are the Laodicean church. So we see seven real churches that had seven real sets of character qualities portrayed by seven different periods of church history later on. And we're in the last stages of the last days. We'll talk about what periods of time are covered by each of those when we get that far. But you know, as you look at that, the, the churches are giving light, but the Bible tells us specifically that Jesus Christ is the light of of the world. But in the text, we're told that the seven lamps, those are the things that are supposed to be giving out light of the seven churches. But we find Christ standing in the midst of the seven churches. Now, with oil is the symbol of the Holy Spirit, the seven oil lamps being the seven churches, which we're told specifically in the text. Jesus is standing in the midst of the churches, empowering us to give his light to the world by the Holy Spirit. You say, well, can you show me some verses that sort of tie that together? Sure. The Apostle Paul talks, Jesus talks about it. Let's look at what Paul says over in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So God is working in you. How is God working in you? When you trusted Jesus Christ, what did God do in your life to transform you and to make you different from inside out? He gave you something as a permanent gift. He gave you his indwelling Holy Spirit. It is God that worketh in you to do of his good pleasure. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can empower you to do right. You cannot do right in the flesh. Paul says, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Period. Bottom line, over and out. Nothing, not even one good thing is in your flesh. It's only as the Spirit of God comes into your life, regenerates your spirit, and begins to transform you into the image of Christ that any good comes out. It's his work, not ours. Then he, finds, then he gives us verse 2, <coughs> which is interesting because it ties in with our message this morning. Sin number one that we've dealt with about the children of Israel, which shows up in every one of their ten different times that they rebel against God is murmuring and complaining. Notice what Paul says in verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. The transformed life, the life that's transformed by the Spirit of God, so that it will be a real witness and not a smudge pot, but a, a, a real light that gives light to the world around us, will be a life that does not have murmuring and disputings, argumentation and complaining. Look at verse 15. Here's our key verse. That ye may be blameless. doesn't say sinless, but blameless. Nobody can point the finger at you and grab hold of you. And harmless. The sons of God without rebuke 
In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, we certainly are. Now look at the last phrase. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world. That's what we see over here in Revelation. The church. It's distinct from the Lord Jesus who is standing there in the midst of the church and it's giving off light. And it's fed by these, you might call them automatic pipe feeders with oil coming in, which is the picture of the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing that will empower the lights. It's not a bunch of LED electronic bulbs that are fake and look like lights, but really aren't. It is real light coming out of these oil lamps. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Now, Jesus himself is the light of the world. But did you know he has commissioned his church to be the light in his absence? Which is precisely what the book of Revelation is talking about here. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we'll begin in verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. Now, Jesus was still here at that time. He's the one in whom, who resides in the Shekinah glory. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But here, he's telling us, he's giving us a job. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. He emphasizes it again, very next verse, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Your light reflects the light of Christ. The Gospels tell us Jesus went about doing good. You know, it is not wrong for a Christian to do good things. It doesn't save you. It doesn't sanctify you. But it is the fruit. It is the result of your salvation. It is the result of your relationship with Christ. It is the result of the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. And you become the light of the world. You shine instead of hiding it like many of us do. We say, man, I, I got to go into work today, so I better cover my light. Don't want anybody to see that I'm a Christian. Because if they did, they might mock me. If they did, they might persecute me. If they did, the boss might find a reason to fire me. I better not let it be seen. Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And then it's not just so to see your good works and pat you on the back. You're not the one getting credit for this. If you do your good works the right way, it is not you that gets the credit. It says that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. When you do the good works, you don't try to take the credit. Instead, you give glory to God the Father. You know, that's what Jesus always did. Jesus never pointed to himself. Jesus always pointed to his Father in heaven. We need to learn how to do that. If you study the life of Christ, you'll discover that he always glorified his Father. Now, here we find Christ in Revelation chapter 1, <clears throat> standing in the midst of the seven churches. Some of them are getting, giving off better light than others. We find he commends, he pats on the back, a number of the churches. He has some scouring rebukes for some of the churches. Because the general character of the church is one that is not giving a pure light and is not giving glory to God the Father. He talks about some that have, like Jezebel, the female leader, uh, who is seducing God's servants to commit fornication. Unbelievable kind of stuff going on in the churches. And being told that it's okay with God. Folks, some serious problems in some of those churches, just like there have been serious problems in many different churches and throughout church history. But they are still the churches of Christ. And they are still obligated to obey him. And they still, every one of them has believers in their midst who are trying to shine as lights. 
And in some cases, they're told, hold fast, because we know how hard it is for you to be there in that church. Christ in the midst of his churches, with the oil of the Holy Spirit, empowering the light that comes out. Next thing we notice is that the lamps are made out of gold. Now, gold is the most precious metal. Since the lamps are the churches, it tells you something about how God views the churches. We are so precious to God that he purchased us with the blood of his son. God purchased us with his own blood. That's what Paul says in Acts 20, 28, indicating that the Lord Jesus Christ is, in fact, God. If you had a solid gold lamp, how would you treat it? Now, if you had a solid gold lamp, say it's this big, that would be a pretty heavy little dude. Gold is a very heavy metal. It's also a very soft metal. And here's an intricately carved lamp, beautiful handle with all sorts of woven lattice work around it and a beautiful spout and perhaps things engraved on the side of it. Would you take that and throw it into the dishwasher? You know, just sort of chuck it in, turn it on the dishwasher and hear it banging around inside there? Uh, would you take that and set it out on your back porch and, and plant uh, some petunias in it and stuck out on the back porch and let it get pecked at by birds and knocked over perhaps? How would you treat the lamp? How would you treat it if it were bought for a hundred million dollars? I'd make it a pretty valuable lamp. Suppose it's some antique from the ancient city of Troy or something like that. And so it's really worth that much money to a collector. And of course it has a value of itself. Would you not take it and put it in a locked location in a fancy display case with all kinds of cameras looking down on it to make sure that nobody could steal it? Isn't that how you treat something of that value? And yet look how much of the church treats the church, the body of Christ. We're not talking buildings, we're talking people. Jesus said it's so valuable that he bought it with his own blood. The next thing we see here in this passage is seven. There are seven churches. Now seven is the number of completeness or perfection in the scripture. Did you know that the Lord Jesus Christ is not going to come back until he has saved every one of his elect. He's not going to leave half of the Laodicean church, which we are. He's not going to leave half of us unsaved and left behind for the tribulation period. The church is going to be complete. We find seven multiple times in the book of Revelation. I did a study on that when we first started our studies on the book of Revelation, how seven is used in scripture, but here we find it used of the church. It's complete. It's not yet fulfilled. That's why we're still here. It's not yet glorified. That's why we see the imperfections that we find in the seven churches in the book of Revelation. But as John looks at from the divine viewpoint, looking down and into the future, he sees the church complete. The seven different periods of church history hadn't taken place when John was standing there on the Isle of Patmos. He was in period number one. But he sees all the way to the end of period number seven, and he sees what goes beyond that because what follows as you move into chapter four are things to come. The church is complete. The church is finished. The church is over. And then God sends judgment upon the earth. That's because, as we saw just a moment ago, the day of the Lord is distinct from the last days. Laodicea is the last days. Then we move into the day of the Lord. Seven, the number of completeness. In the sovereign plan of God, all of the church elect will be saved, even though some are not living to his satisfaction. And we see that in the letters to the seven churches in the following two chapters. I think I'm going to stop there tonight. We still have five minutes to go, but I think that's a good place to stop in our overview of this first passage. 
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word as it has gone forth tonight, that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. We thank you for the book of Revelation, which tells us the things that were, the things that are, and the things that will be, past, present, and future, and ties it all together, explains to us the entire overview and scope of church history, explains to us why the church is not here during the tribulation period, explains to us the specific judgments which were hinted at in the Old Testament in the multiple passages dealing with the day of the Lord, gives us extensive information about the millennial period, which is also dealt with in great detail under the day of the Lord passages in the Old Testament. And Father, we pray that you might help us to understand as we go through symbol by symbol and looking at the way the scripture itself explains it so that we might understand and with joy begin to share Christ and not hide our lamp under a bushel, but lift it up on high so that it gives light to all the house. Our Lord Jesus Christ didn't ask us if we'd do it. He told us we are the light of the world. We are the ones that are representing him. We are the ones that are supposed to be shining forth to the world around us. We are the ones to whom the gospel has been committed. He didn't commit it to angels. He committed it to fallible, sinful people. And then he empowers us by the oil of the Holy Spirit to preach the word, to be instant in season, out of season, to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Make us faithful repositories of the truth and then shine in our lamps brightly, cutting away the wick that is defiled by sin so that we might give a pure light, a smokeless light, a light that leads others to Christ. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.